I admire your stamina, you know, here for the last talk on the last day. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Good to see you. Uh, this talk is basically just a collection of miscellaneous examples that I've put together over the years just to show interesting features. Um, when I talk to Java developers, I call this advanced Groovy tips and tricks. But for people who are very familiar with Groovy, you'll find a lot of this quite routine. Uh, but I thought I'd show you some interesting examples. I do have some slides. I don't know how much I'm going to use them. It's really much more of a code-focused talk. Uh, so I'll show you examples. Uh, everything is in a GitHub repository, uh, which I may change as we do the talk. And I'll just push the changes immediately there, so you'll be able to grab it whenever you like. If you clone it, then I'll push changes. You can update it whenever you want. So at any rate, uh, mine. My name's Ken Cousin. Uh, it's Cousin like the relative, as I mentioned. Uh, there's my email address, uh, ken.cousin at cousinit.com. Again, I say Cousin IT, but my wife says Cousin It, like the Adams family. The, in, my, in my defense, by the way, Cousin It and the Adams family is ITT. There's two T's, so it's totally unrelated. You know, not a problem at all. Uh, there's my Twitter handle, homepage, blog, and the base GitHub repository, or my GitHub account is at github.com slash my last name. Uh, I have a link in here for the, the actual code is in a repository that's called Advanced Groovy again. But it's, you know, again, advanced is a very subtle, you know, it's a marketing term, honestly, you know. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of books. Uh, the Making Java Groovy book came out, I can't believe it, three whole years ago. That, that just amazes. Well, almost, maybe not quite three, two and a half. Um, that's a Manning book. And I have this Great Old Recipes for Android book that is out. It's in the production process. It'll be out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, as a reward for you coming to this talk, let me give you a couple of coupon codes. Um, now, Manning Books, they're already publishing a coupon code. I don't remember what the one is for this conference. The one I have is uh, my last name, K-O-U-S-E-N, all lowercase, with the number 37 after it. So Cousin 37, and that'll give you a 37% discount on any Manning book, as long as my book's in the shopping cart. No, that's not true. You, know, uh, you don't have to buy mine. At any rate, it's there. Um, you could try Cousin 85 and see if that works, you know. <laughs> but if you really think it through, you try Cousin 105 and see if they'll pay you to take it away, you know. Uh, for the O'Reilly books, um, the, the Great Old Recipes for Android is an O'Reilly book. That one, use the coupon code. Now, this is all capitals, uh, A-U-T-H-D, auth D, whatever that means. That'll give you 40% off of books and 50% off of videos. Speaking of videos, I've got a whole series of videos that are published at shop.oreilly.com. If you have a Safari account, you can add these to your, they're all included in the Safari distribution. Uh, if you have a Safari account and you're not using it for anything, then when you get to work Monday morning, put these in your shop, you know, in your file and just play them continuously in the background. Everybody will enjoy it. And All right, I can't do it. At any rate, so there's those if you're interested. Okay, moving on. Uh, I have a few topics here, but I'm actually going to show you some alternative examples. I want to talk about closures because there's some somewhat unexpected behavior that some people find on closures. Again, not real advanced, but I found it a little surprising. I want to talk a little bit about closure coercion. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the delegation. I do want to show a little bit of the runtime metaprogramming, mostly because um, I learned a pattern from Jeff Brown years ago called intercept, cache, and invoke, and I've got a somewhat amusing little example that works with it. As with most things, I find that if I have a gag to tell, I'll work really, really hard, even if I later take the gag out, you know, so of course I've got a little joke involved in that one. I do want to show you some, a, a nice little example of operator overloading, assuming we have time for that. Uh, some cool Groovy JDK methods. Yeah, there's that pattern again. And a few AST transforms that may not occur to you on a regular basis. Those tend to be really helpful both in practice and as a way to show non-Groovy developers what unbelievable power Groovy can have with minimal amounts of code. Writing AST transforms is tedious and annoying and debugging them can be awkward and everything. 
That's part of the reason that GORM inside of Grails has moved to traits as much as possible. But using AST transforms, that's trivial, and that's a lot of fun. So I use that a lot. So that's a rough idea. I do have, a, a, say, miscellaneous examples, and I will just go through as many as we have time for in the next, I guess, 45 minutes, and then we'll be all set. Uh, okay, so let me start off. Actually, I want to start off with something different here. Now, everything is in a GitHub repository. Uh, let me actually show you the, the GitHub repository here. Let me open another uh, browser. Here we go. So if I go to uh, github.com slash my last name, and then I uh, go to, actually, it's this advanced groovy one right here. Advanced Groovy, it's, again, it's examples from my Advanced Groovy Tips and Tricks talk. Again, for, the, for a Groovy, an audience that's comfortable with Groovy, you may not find a lot of it terribly advanced, but if you're interested in the examples, they're all part of this GitHub repo. Uh, okay, now, one of the interesting things that happened is when I was teaching a Groovy class, because that's my normal day job, is I teach software development training classes most of the time. Uh, for related Java-related projects, Spring, Hibernate, Groovy, Grails, Gradle, etc. cetera. Uh, I was trying to do a little example to show something about prime numbers. I was trying to say, you know, let's find out whether a number is prime or not. And to show you how simple the example was, uh, I wrote a little method like this. I just had a little is prime method that took a, an integer. How's the font size on that? Can you see that OK? OK, good. So. Again, if x is 2, then that's true. And otherwise, I'm going to go up to the number or less than the number, and for each one, do a modulus with the number. And if that's 0, then obviously it's not prime. And if it makes it through this whole thing return true, then it is prime. Uh, now, it turns out you don't have to go all the way up to the number. You have to go up to the square root of the number plus 1. And that's all you need to check when you're dividing by it. And this method looked perfectly fine, but of course, as they say, never trust a, you know, a test you haven't seen fail. If I say, let's try just for 2 up to 20 and do find all by running is prime on this, I mean, in a way, this, I guess, should be a groovy puzzler. If I just run this, you'll see that all the numbers from 2 up to 20 wind up returning true as is prime. And I don't know if it's obvious to anybody, I suppose Cedric's here and, and uh, by the way, Cedric, this is important. Space, 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 you know. It's not tabs, it's space, you know, very important. At any rate, um, do you see what's wrong with this? Do you immediately see the problem here? You may or may not. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. Is it what didn't occur to me at first when I first learned about this is that when you return from a closure, you don't return from the method. You only return from the closure. So what's happening is, is that even when I put in like 4, which should be uh, prime, as I come in here and I go, okay, well, divide by uh, 2, and if x mod 2 equals equals 0, I should return false. That returns only from the closure, not from the method. So even though it basically just says, okay, false here, I, I fall down to return true, and every single number winds up saying it's prime, you know, which is ridiculous. But... When I tried to understand it, I came up with what is either an explanation, if you agree with me, or just a rationalization otherwise. And my rationalization is that, again, a closure is effectively a separate object. It's a method being treated as an additional object. So what I'm doing, a return from inside a closure, I'm returning from that object, not from the method as a whole. And that, again, tends to take most relatively new Groovy developers by surprise. They don't expect that. So that this doesn't work at all. So when I first encountered this, I went, oh my goodness, I've got a serious problem here. So I went on, um, I, I tried various other options here, and let me show you uh, what I mean by that, is that let me open this up and I'll show you the examples here. So if I, I tried this, I tried saying, all right, let me replace the body with the following. So let me copy this and I'll put it back in the Groovy console here. And then I'll explain what I have. So the idea is to say, well, let me switch um, to, I'd like to put in a break. I'd like to actually put in a break statement, if you will. 
And of course, that's what I mean. I'd like to just simply go, okay, if n, x mod n is zero, I just like to go break. And of course, this doesn't work because you're not allowed to do a break statement inside here. And that looked, again, very strange to me because I'm, I'm in a loop, right? I mean, I'm, I'm operating over each element from two up to the limit. You'd think I could put in a break statement, but again, I'm inside a closure. It's inside a separate object. It has no idea there's any loop going on. And therefore, it goes, sorry, breaks are only allowed inside, a break is statements only allowed inside loops or switches. And it, it looks like a break statement, but it's not. So this, again, is the exact same issue from before. The, the difference here, of course, is that um, I did, in fact, get the prime numbers this time. You know, I was able to set a local variable called result set it to true, assign the variable inside the closure, and then return that variable at the end. So it's kind of a kludge, not a good one. And then, by the way, this would not even be legal inside of Java 8 lambdas, because then I'm declaring a local variable which has to be either final or effectively final, and I've gone and violated that restriction. So, in other words, if this was Java 8, it wouldn't even be legal to do this. This would just be a kludge. And the fact that it happened to work was just a symptom of the fact that Groovy allows you to modify local variables even inside closures. You know, so uh, when they do eventually support the Java 8 Lambda syntax inside of Groovy, this may or may not even work with Java 8 Lambdas. So it was a workaround, but not a good workaround, you know. So then the next attempt I made at trying to fix this was to say, look, I mean, if, if I'm having all this trouble with closures, let's get rid of the closure. You know, let's, let's go redo this another way. And in this case, I switched to a for loop. Now I'm inside a for in loop, inside a groovy, for n in two dot dot limit. I'm going to put in my if statement, and now I can put in a break because I am in a loop. You know, I don't have the closure anymore. I get the right answer out of this, and everything is fine, except that I just kind of killed the whole reason I made the example, which was to dem demonstrate that returning from a closure only returned from the closure. Of course, the other thing that I now realize is I don't need this local variable anymore. Right? I went to the trouble to add the local variable, and of course it's not necessary. So I can actually just go back here and say, all right, let's do the, the just normal return statement. So let me reduce this down to its simplest form. I'll just say there's my limit for n in to dot dot limit if x mod n is zero, return false, and I'm finished, and, and that works fine. Uh, the only problem, again, is that I eliminated the excuse for having the example in the first place. But it does work. So then I, I think I got this far on my own, and then I wrote a blog post about this, you know, as I, as I often do, uh, to embarrass myself, to say, hey, I made this mistake, and by the way, maybe somebody will learn from it. And, of course, who should answer, but uh, you may know the name Tim Yates. Uh, Tim Yates is an incredibly good Groovy developer, especially in terms of things like algorithms. Whenever he tweets anything in terms of an algorithm, I'm like, okay, I'm either going to have to spend an hour digging into this, or it's going to be this really elegant solution to the problem. And he pointed out that even though I had thought of using find all with a closure down here, I had totally forgotten to just use a find method up here. And his solution was to say, well, wait a minute, here's your elegant solution here. Right? So I got this from Tim Yates, so I'm giving him credit anyway, or blame. He says, look, there's my limit, uh, return x equals equals 2 or or not 2 dot dot limit dot find. Right? I mean, in other words, delegate it to the find method, which returns the first value that satisfies the closure. And if none of them satisfy the closure, then I'm good, right? Then I clearly have a prime number. And now I'm back to... A, a nice effective mechanism, which again, this is the way that they'd want you to solve this with Java 8, because no longer do I have a local variable that I'm trying to modify, I am doing a filter effectively, so that in Java 8, this would be a, a filter with a predicate, and my predicate would be the closure here to see whether any of the values satisfied the predicate. So this is actually arguably the right way to solve the problem, even though once again I've thrown away the, the reason that the problem came up in the first place. Uh, the other thing I put in here is that I couldn't resist the, the motivation to say, you know what, uh, why don't I use a little bit of metaprogramming 
and add an is prime method to numbers meta class, which I really shouldn't have done. I should add it to integer, you know, but I wanted to handle all integer types. So I went with number, even though technically it doesn't make sense to do is prime on a floating point value, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, if I just take the delegate and cast it to integer, then I can do this same exact thing. And then instead of going is prime of it, I can go it dot is prime as a method. And that works as well. You know, I've added the is prime method to, well, number, even though really to do it right I should add it to integer long short byte and big integer I suppose but I couldn't think of any obvious way to do that so at any rate I thought it was a very interesting simple example of the demonstration that returning from a closure only returns from the closure and not from the method because that's a particularly counterintuitive result for new Groovy developers, certainly for people from a Java background. It also gives me the opportunity to tell you my one and only uh, prime number joke. Um, there's a, the joke goes that there's a one question math test, uh, prove or disprove that all odd numbers are prime, okay? So that the the mathematician goes three is prime and five is prime and therefore by induction all odd numbers are prime. You know, The more math you know, the funnier that one is, by the way. Uh, the physicist goes three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, nine. Oh, well, well that could be experimental error. Eleven is prime, thirteen is prime, yeah, that's got to be enough, right? The engineer goes three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, nine is prime, eleven is prime, thirteen is prime, right? You know. The computer scientist goes, three is prime, five is prime, five is prime, five is prime, five is prime, you know. And of course the manager, or adjust this to suit, uh, says two is prime, four is prime, six is prime, eight is prime. So at any rate, there's your prime number joke. See, more value added for you coming to the talk today, right, you know. So at any rate, I just wanted to show you that one. I thought that was an interesting example. And it, again, when I was relatively new to Groovy, that took me by surprise, and I thought you might find it interesting. Uh, I have that all in here. Uh, how's that font size? Do I need to increase that at all? The, the a thumbs up being it's fine, not make it bigger. Okay. Uh, one thing I did put in here is that I wanted all of these implementations in the same file just so I could demonstrate it. So I had to give them all different names, the is primes one through five. And in order to run my little check, Therefore, I wrote a check implementation that takes a closure and therefore invokes the closure on it during the find all to make sure that this is right. And in order to invoke this, I use the groovy version of a method reference. You know, again, from Java 8, that be the double colon notation. And again, this is something that often doesn't occur to relatively inexperienced Groovy developers is the ability to pass a closure as an argument and simply invoke it and this way use a method as effectively a closure by using the ampersand. You know, it's a very primitive way to start writing DSLs as well as you're borrowing methods from other classes and giving them names if you like. Here I'm borrowing the isPrime1 method and invoking it inside here by passing it as a closure and then running it. So again, it's the sort of thing that if you don't have a lot of experience with Groovy, it would not occur to you unless somebody showed it to you. So I just threw it in there. The benefit, of course, is that now I can run this entire script and wind up having it be successful, you know, passing correctly. But I'm actually testing things and making sure that everything is correct because I threw in the assert keywords on that. So again, just thought you might find that a little bit interesting. Okay, now in closure coercion, uh, it used to be back in Java, uh, Groovy 1.8, I think it was, that whenever you used a closure as the implementation of an interface, you had to use the as keyword to say the interface as this uh, closure, or pardon me, the other way around, the closure as the interface. Then starting, it was either in Groovy 2.0 or 2.2, it might have been 2.2, that if there was no ambiguity, in the method call you were making. In other words, if the method was not overloaded with a bunch of arguments, the method was over, only had one version with a single interface type as an argument, you didn't have to say as anymore. And it would just coerce it automatically. And as a trivial 
implementation of this. This is a Java method that lists directory names and says, okay, a new file, and I use the list method, which takes a file name filter, for example, as an argument. And in Java, you'd have to write the anonymous inner class. Now, of course, in Java 8, you don't have to do that anymore. You could provide a lambda there. But the idea was that I have this, anon this anonymous inner class that has an accept method in here, and the purpose is, is I just want to return methods that are, in fact, directories. Uh, pardon me, I want to return files that are directories, and I want to list those. So the way to do this in Groovy, however, is that I could simply write list and provide a closure that had the same arguments as the accept method here was expecting. See, here's the accept method inside a file name filter. takes a file and a directory. So I provide the file and the directory and then just provide the implementation. And back in the early days of Groovy, I would have to have said as file name filter here to indicate to the compiler that even though I'm invoking a Java method call, it's okay because the Java method call is looking for a file name filter and I would wind up coercing the closure into that method. Now, of course, I don't have to do that. I could just provide the closure and Groovy will go, oh yeah, well, there, aren't, there isn't any ambiguity there. If there was an overload that took a second type of interface that had a signature similar to that, then I would have a problem. And it's nice to know I could do that. Now, the other interesting thing about Groovy, of course, is that you can coerce a... See, one of the differences between Groovy and Java 8, actually, I want to mention. In Java 8, the only thing you can assign a lambda to is what they call a functional interface. It's an interface with a single abstract method. In Groovy, however, you can coerce a closure into an interface type, even if the interface has several abstract methods in it, which seems really weird, and you just have to be careful that you're not trying to provide implementations for methods you didn't care about, you know. But what if you want to provide different methods, or pardon me, different closures for different methods in the interface? That's always the question that people would ask me. So I would say, all right, well, let's say I have a Java interface called utility methods that has a get positives method when I provide a, a variable argument list of integers and I want back an integer array of the positive ones. And I also have my good old is palindrome method to, say, to see whether or not something is in fact a palindrome. Well, the easiest way to implement this is to say, what the heck, I'll make a groovy class that implements the interface. I mean, Groovy classes can implement Java interfaces, no big deal. Get positives is simply a find all. And is palindrome is very simple because I do a replace all with backslash capital W with empty string. That will replace everything that is, um, well, backslash lowercase w is lowercase a to z, capital A to z, zero through nine, and an underscore. And backslash capital W is everything that isn't that. So I'm going to miss underscores, okay, when I do this. If, I, if my string had underscores in it, I'm not going to replace those. But everything else, it'll replace with an empty string, and that lets me get rid of all the punctuation. I also convert it to lowercase because palindromes aren't case sensitive. So I make my test string by converting it to lowercase and replacing all the punctuation with an empty string. And this is always a nice thing to point out to Java developers is that in Java, of course, you never use equals equals with a class. You use the dot equals method with a class. Equals equals checks to see if two references are assigned to the same object. In Groovy, of course, equals equals, like all other operators in Groovy, invokes a method. <laughs> equals equals either invokes the dot equals method or the compare to method and checks it against zero if the class happens to implement comparable. Okay, so in Groovy, you're always using equals equals all over the place in your test cases instead of a dot equals method because it's even null safe. I mean, if the left hand side is a null, equals equals checks to see whether the right hand side's a null. If it is, it returns true, otherwise false. But it looks like this. And finally, by the way, Groovy JDK adds a reverse method to string, which we've needed all along, you know, so it's really nice that we have that. So at any rate, the easiest way to implement the utility methods is just to make a class and implement the, the interface, and then what I have, of course, is a test case for this, and if I do the, the regular good old groovy JUnit4 implementation here, there's my Java interface, there's my groovy class, I can check positives, and I have this nice list of palindromes, like do geese see God, and go hang a salami, I'm a lasagna hog. I mean, aren't those great? You know? And if I simply execute this as a regular old test, then 
I expect to get green. And of course, never trust a test you haven't seen fail. This is not a palindrome. Make sure I'm not just returning true on that. And that's fine. And that's how I would normally handle it. But the question came up, well, what if I want to do coerced closures? Well, here I have this, this bizarre little option down here. So in this case, what I've done is to say I'm providing a map where the keys are the names of the methods and the values are closures that are the implementations of the methods. So in this case, get positives is the same closure you just saw and same thing with this palindrome. And then I say as utility methods, now I've provided an implementation of the interface by using a map where the keys are the method names and the values are the closures that I want. It's reasonable for say mock objects that you want to have as an implementation of an interface. Right here I'm demonstrating as the actual implementation. I wouldn't necessarily use this in practice. I'd use this as a mock mechanism if I didn't want to create an expando or something like that. And by the way, on that huge list of palindromes, in addition to a Santa pets rats as Pat taps a star step at NASA, which is a good one, or oi oi, a tonsil is not a yo-yo, there is a palindrome that goes over about 30 lines here. And I figured, well, hey, a nice little example that uses a multi-line groovy string. And believe it or not, you know, when I execute this guy, everything does in fact work there as well. So I couldn't resist doing this just because I, you know, wanted to have this giant palindrome in there. But it's a really the, the formal example is to demonstrate that you can do coerce closures by coercing a map into an interface you know, and therefore provide different implementations for each of the methods in the interface. So kind of an interesting one, you know, feel free to, to grab that or use that however you like. Now, this idea of the operator overloading is something that I bring up when I talk to Java developers as well, and that always makes people nervous. You know, it's like, well, Java didn't support operator overloading for a reason. You know, it's like, that's bad. People are going to override multiply to be addition or something, which may be job security, you know, uh, but it's not a good plan in general. Uh, but I wanted to point out that you can do operator overloading if you want, even in Java. That's the cool part. So I have this little example here where I have this class called employee. Now that's a Java class. It's just a pojo, which is a wrapper for an ID and a name. That's all I have in there. I do have a two string method, but I didn't add anything else. And here I have a Java implementation of a department that has an ID and a name and a map of integer to employee, which whenever I hire an employee is going to put the employee in the map under the employee's ID. That's all it's going to do. And then what I like to show them is that in addition to having a hire method and a layoff method, I overrode or I input, implemented plus and minus and left shift, which are the methods that Groovy would use for the plus sign, the minus sign, and a left shift, of course. And of course, you notice that the argument can be different from the return type. My plus method here takes an employee, hires the employee, and returns this. And the same thing with a minus method, lays off the employee, returns this, and a left shift is just another way of saying higher. And by adding these methods to a Java class, it's kind of cool to see that in my test case down here, and this one I finally put in a Spock test to justify wearing the shirt, by the way, that was the whole point there. Uh, I figured that Marcin would appreciate that. I saw him in here somewhere. Oh, maybe he went somewhere else. At any rate... Uh, here I have a Java department and saying add an employee to the department should increase the total number of employees by one. So given Fred, when I invoke department plus Fred, then the new size of the employees collection is the old size plus one. I can also do the chained plus because I'm returning this. So department plus Fred plus Barney, now the size is two. Or I could do the same thing with a subtraction. I can also use a left shift for the same thing. And I have done operator overloading on Java classes as long as, what, nobody's waving or whatever? At any rate, as long as the, um, the script that I'm using or the code that I'm using is in Groovy, Groovy will invoke the appropriate method for the operator, even though the operator is being implemented in a Java class. And I always found that kind of cool too. It's the sort of thing that, again, wouldn't probably occur to most people to even try, and yet it works just fine. Kind of cool there. 
So I just thought I'd show that as an operator overloading example. Again, I don't tend to do a lot of operator overloading in my own code, uh, but operator overloading exists throughout the standard library, and it really helps you understand what to look up when you're not sure how something works. Uh, as an aside, Java developers always then ask me, well, what if I do want to know if two references are pointing to the same object? And then I say, well, Groovy provides an is method for that. A dot is B is the one that checks if two references are assigned to the same object. This is why make that the default for equals, you know, when that's really not what we're after. We're after equivalence, not assignment like that. Now, the idea of talking about operator reloading and that sort of stuff brings up the, another kind of an odd one, which is the idea of a range. Now, in Groovy, any class can become a range if it has a next method, a previous method, and implements comparable, so that you could order them in some way. So I wanted to demonstrate using a, a regular old POJO, or POGO in this case, as a range. So what I did is I made a class called train station, because I'm going to have train stations along a track. And that's a natural range because trains visit individual stations as they move along the track. Or if you really come right down to it, I'm making a doubly linked list. <laughs> okay? That's really all I'm doing here. Now, the easy part is doing the next and the previous assignment because each train station will have a next one and a previous one. So my next method returns the next uh, station along the track and the previous method returns the previous one. The question was, how am I going to implement comparable? So as I mentioned yesterday, I tend to do this demo with a little geocoder here. And the geocoder is using Google's geocoder. So that in this case, I encode the city and state using a URL encoder to make sure in case I have any spaces in the names of the cities or the states. And by the way, I call it city and state because I'm in the U.S. This works all over the world. You know, it's, it's again, it's uh, Google doesn't care. They just want to know the address as a URL encoded string. So at any rate, I URL encode this, the city and state. This is an old version of this. I don't need the sensor anymore. But I take the map and do a collect of it and join them with an ampersand. That's actually interesting. Let me show you something here about that. Uh, for years, when I was trying to build up a query string, I would do something like this. I'd have a map. Let me just say A is 1 and B is 2 and C is also 2. And I would go collect of each key and value and return a key equals value. You see, because that would convert my map into a list with key equals value. And then I could do a join with an ampersand. And I was demonstrating this at uh, a talk at the Spring one, at one of the Spring 1 2GX conferences, and Paul King was in the room. Now, don't think that doesn't throw you off your game. As I'm talking, quote, advanced groovy, and here comes Paul freaking King, you know, uh, a personal hero, by the way. I just assume everything Paul King says is right, you know, and go from there. That seems to be pretty safe. At any rate, he, is such a nice person, as usual, comes up to me after the talk and says, by the way, you know, and that's how all these groovy conversations start. You know you could, uh, the two string method on map.entry is key equals value, right? So if that's the case, I could replace this whole block with it and I get the exact same thing. You know, it's like, oh, of course, you know, it just never occurred to me like that, that the, again, when, when you do a collect or any method on maps in Groovy, they, that takes a closure, either takes a one argument closure where the one argument is the map dot entry or a two argument closure where it splits the keys and the values for you. And I had always just used the two argument version thinking, what would I need the map dot entry for? Well, the two string method on map dot entry is key equals value and I'm all set. So back in my example, I use the collect with an it to reduce that and join them with an ampersand so that now I have my query string. So this is the full URL, the base URL with the query string appended to it. I use a new XML slurper with a parse method to go to the web page, download the XML response. In this case, they do the content negotiation right in the URL. So I'm downloading the XML response, parse it into a DOM tree and hands me the root. And therefore, I can simply walk the tree and say, updating this station here, the latitude and longitude are the response.result0, dot geometry, dot location, dot lat and long, and convert them to big decimals. What you're not seeing 
actually I did have it here, I didn't emphasize it, is that in here I have my city and state and the train station, and I added big decimals for latitude and longitude. I could have just made them doubles, but just for the sake of argument. So what this method will do is it will take my train station and update the latitude and longitude with the results that are coming back from the Google Geocoder. And now I can implement comparable, my compare to method. So I say I'm implementing comparable of train station. And my compare to simply checks the latitude using the good old spaceship operator. Uh, I love that guy. I always tell people, I, I used to think that any language that had a spaceship operator was inherently cool. And then I found out that Perl had a spaceship operator. And there's just no definition of the word cool that includes Perl. You know, sorry. Um, but at any rate, I was able to use the spaceship operator here. So doing all of this and having a nice little two-string method to print it out allowed me to create a bunch of train stations. Uh, there they are. This is the northeast corridor of Amtrak. Uh, trains that in Europe you would consider a joke and you'd be right. But at any rate, from Washington, Baltimore, Wilmington, all the way up to Boston, I skipped a few added them there. I had to set the next and the previous methods manually. I could have done various insert methods or overridden plus or minus to do the insert into the linked list. But here I was just trying to manually set them up. So now I create my geocoder. I fill in the lat latitude and longitude for each. And now I can use my train stations in a in a range from Washington to Boston, print each one, or from Boston to Washington, the same thing, or just a sub range from New York City down to Boston. I can execute all of those. And you see, there was my URLs for the Google Geocoder being printed out. And you can see the latitudes and longitudes being printed as I go, as I walk through it. So just a nice, simple demonstration of how you can take a pogo, if you will, and turn it into a range if you feel the need to, uh, to do that. I, again, I'm still searching for a cool use case for this. This is as close as I could come. But again, now that you know it's possible, it's kind of interesting to see an example there. Okay, now, um, since I only got another 15 minutes, let me show you a couple of interesting metaprogramming examples. Now, again, this is very simple stuff, but once again, I had a use case. And the use case was, is somebody tweeted, you know, I need some better log levels. Instead of just warn and error and everything, I need an OMG level or a WTF level, you know. And I laughed. I thought that was really funny. And then it occurred to me that with Groovy Metaprogramming, I could do that. You know, it wouldn't be that hard. Now, I, I'm not going to use log4j or SLF4j, anything like that, because I wanted to make this all self-contained in my little project here. So um, where's the one where I was looking at this? Instead, what I did is if I go to uh, my Java 8 API, you'll notice that there's a class called uh, logger. And here's the logger class. And the logger class has all the methods that we're looking for, except that none of the names make any sense, like find, finer, and finest. And uh, they have an info level, but they also have things like, uh, uh, I forget, what a bunch of weird little, I mean, why couldn't they have just used the config and the, or the warn and error and info and verbose levels that we've been used to forever? I don't know. What you find out, however, is that when you use this, this Java Commons logger is that all of those methods delegate down to this method right here. The log method that takes a level and a string. This is the message you're trying to log and this is the guy they're using. By the way, for those of you who haven't played with Java 8 a lot, they have now overloaded this to take a supplier and what that means is, is that if you're doing logging in Java 7, then it assembles the message with string concatenation or whatever you provided, whether or not you're at a log level that would display that string. So, I mean, if you did log.info and you had the string and yet you were at a level of warn or something, you're wasting the assembly process. Now, it's not a huge inefficiency, but whatever. But by overloading this for supplier, then what happens is, is the supplier is only evaluated if you are at the log level that would wind up logging the actual message. 
which is pretty cool. I mean, I assume that Log4j and the others will eventually add this. Of course, if they're going to add it, they're going to require you to go to Java 8. So that's a different decision that they have to make on that. But it's kind of a neat implementation. At any rate, if I want to make my own log level, then I need to do something with this level here. Now, the level class is interesting. See, these are the levels. Severe, warning, info, config, fine, finer, and finest of all things. But if you look at this, there's constants for those, and they have a protected constructor, believe it or not, so that if you're going to make your own custom level, you need to extend this class, call the superclass constructor with your new level, and you need to make up an integer that, rel that shows the severity relative to all the others. So with that background in mind, what I have here is I made my custom level class to simply say class custom level extends level, and there's an AST transform you don't see every day, inherit constructors, which basically takes all the constructors from level and implements them here, and they each call super, you know? Now, it's not exactly difficult to write that you know, or even to have the IDE generated, but it's a cool example of an AST transform that can be very useful in cases like this. So now, to use this guy, I decided to override method missing because the goal here is I wanted to be able to let the user specify any log level they want and whatever name they pick is going to wind up being a log level and this is what brings me to that pattern of intercept, cache, and invoke. So the idea behind intercept, cache, and invoke is that the first time you call this log level, the method doesn't exist. So it's missing, and the method missing will intercept that call. Then I'm going to come up with an implementation and then cache it on the meta class. Save it so that it's on the meta class, so that the next time, and invoke it, of course, in order to show the actual execution. But then the second time you call it, it's not missing anymore. And this is something that they did in Grails for years, which is how I found out about it, because again, I found out about it from Jeff Brown. So the method missing method takes a string name and then the arguments, and I put a print line in here to see that I am actually inside that, me that method. Then I made up a log level by taking the difference between severe and warning and taking a random number out of that and adding it to warning. So all my new log levels will be somewhere between warning and severe, whatever that happens to be. Then I instantiate my new custom level class with the new name and the value. And all of this was preparation for the fact that the implementation is take this ar array of arguments and invoke the log method on the delegate using my new custom level. And this is the message that was sent in, that first argument on the list. So this closure is the implementation I'm after. So this was the intercept, this is the part where I create the implementation, and then this is something that, again, I would not have non known until I saw it, until somebody showed it to me. I don't want to put metaclass.name, because even though I've got a variable called name coming in here, if I go metaclass.name, then I'll create a method on the metaclass called name, when what I want is the value of that variable. And one of the ways you can get at the value is to inject it into a groovy string. By injecting it into the string, it will evaluate it. And Groovy's perfectly fine with putting a string on the meta class and having that be the name of the method. And then I assign it to my implementation and then finally implement it. So there's the intercept. Here's the part where you cache it on the meta class and then invoke it right here. So now to demonstrate this, I could put in a hey method, and whoa, and notice I'll call ROFL like three times. So you'll see that the first time it's missing and the other times it's not missing anymore and I could add in whatever you want, you know. Again, I, I, you could tell at the time when I was writing this I had a teenage son, you know. Sup, you know, or whatever, you know. At any rate, so if I run this script, you'll see. Now, the weirdness I've never quite understood is that for some reason, Java has always uh, logged messages to standard error. I don't quite know why, but that's what loggers do is they log to standard error. So I've got a race condition going on here between my standard out, where I'm doing the print line, and standard error where I'm seeing the, the, the distribution. But you can see inside method missing with one of them, and then there it is using it. And here it is with WHOA, and whoa, dude, you know. And here's the first ROFL, 
with the method missing, and then I'm invoking it three times, and only the first time it's missing. And it's really a cool pattern. And I know Gorm has largely replaced most of their, uh, their intercept, ca- most of the dynamic metaprogramming stuff with either uh, AST transforms or now traits. But I was just asking Jeff Brown and, and with thing, well, I asked Graham, that when they're doing the gi- giant dynamic finders, find all, buy this, like, and, and, that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they still do this sort of thing for that because they have no idea what they're going to be at compile time. And I just thought this is kind of a neat little demo just to show you how the intercept cache invoke mechanism works as well as this neat little idea of injecting a a variable inside a string so that you can see the evaluation of it. Okay, So kind of a a way of getting a value there and and I've got a bunch of other examples as well. Uh, so that's that. Now, I have one other possible example that uh, might be worth taking a look at. Uh, actually, I have a bunch of other examples in this, but let me just mention one by name. Is that I was uh, using another RESTful web service. This time, I was looking at uh, the other way. You may know this site, openweathermap.org, which is a way of, of invoking a RESTful web service and downloading JSON data representing weather reports in your city, wherever that happens to be. Again, the nice thing about this is it works all over the world. The downside, from my point of view, is I have to get a key in order to evaluate it. But it's easy enough to execute, and I have a little example with Open Weather Map here, where I have my key, so did you copy that down real fast? Actually, I checked it into source code control, you know, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> but if I just do a, a simple little parse, then, for example, here, if I bring in my, uh, the key inside a file, there's the base URL with the app ID and a, and a query for a city and state, which as long as I'm here, why don't I change that? Now, I, again, I'm not exactly sure what Open Weather Map is expecting for country codes. I don't know if I could get away with DK or if I'm going to spell it out. I'll spell it out and see what happens. This is going to convert the, UR, the string into a URL and then invoking the get text method and then I'll print it. And then the rest of this I'm going to show in a minute. So let me comment that out for a moment. And if I simply execute this much, I should be able to see the JSON data. Uh, yeah, I'm having some difficulties with this for some reason. I found that if I go the other direction here, I believe, and uh, I put in my braces now. If this doesn't work, I'll just go to the one that I, that I made sure does, in fact, work. This used to work just fine, and now it's behaving a little strangely. Yeah, I don't know why I'm getting my ampersand, I believe, is the one that's getting all messed up on this. Uh, but it, it generally does work. Uh, I'll show you the one that works, because I don't want to take any more time than necessary on this. But what you do get back is JSON data, and then you could parse it. What I wanted to show, however, is that I could use Google's JSON to map the JSON data into an actual um, class. And here, what I did is, again, this is a nice demo for non groovy people is to say, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at the JSON response, I have to map it element by element, make a class which has attributes that are other classes and work my way down. And I can put all of those in one file inside, um, inside groovy. So if I look at this, then I do believe they have a sample of the data. Yeah, here's the API and here's the current weather data. And if I look at this, uh, here you can see that you get coordinates and system and weather, which can be multiple elements, and main, wind, rain, clouds, all this stuff. Now, here's a weird part. For ex- Oh, it thinks it's a phone number. Very good. Uh, yeah, I should just call it, just see what happens. No, I'm not going to do it. That's a timestamp, which is in seconds from the epoch, okay? So, and then weirder than that is you see the temperatures This temperature is in Kelvin of all things, believe it or not. Kelvin, I'm like, you're kidding me, but okay, there it is. So this is the sort of response I'm dealing with. So I went back to here and I said, all right, I'm going to start top down, and there's my time stamp and an ID and a name and whatever the COD is. And then each of these are going to be classes, coordinates, main, system. There's my collection of weather. I put in my method to convert to, and please forgive me, 
Fahrenheit, you know. I know we're the last country in the whole world that uses Fahrenheit. There are other bizarre countries that use some of the English units we use. Nobody, nobody else uses Fahrenheit. Uh, sorry, you know. But at any rate, there's my conversion to Fahrenheit. Here's my conversion from meters per second into miles per hour for the wind speed. Here's my conversion from the seconds in the epic to milliseconds, which is what Java uses, and then use it in a date constructor so I convert the time. And there's my getter methods to convert all of those, and a massive two-string method just to print out the weather reports. And the rest of this is just pogos, you know? There's my main coordinates, weather, system, etc. And then to use this, again, I'd go over it more slowly if we had more time, but just to give you an idea, here is my class which says, there's my key, there is the base URL. I instantiate Google's JSON. I do my get weather method where I put in optional arguments for city and state. I take my map, assemble everything to build the URL. There's the query string, there's the URL. Get the text and use JSON's from JSON method to take that, that uh, response, convert it into one of these model objects, and then invoke the two-string method just to see the results. And here's the test case to give you an idea what this looks like. I have a test case for the model spec where I check the temperature, speed, and time conversions. But here is the open weather spec. So there's my default city and state, which, uh, again, all I can check is the, you know, the, the latitude and longitude. I don't know what the weather's going to be, you know. There's... <laughs> Boston, there's Honolulu, I always have, uh, I've got other examples like this where I say, uh, you know, there's Paul King's, you know, Brisbane, Australia, here's, uh, oh yeah, they put in Paris for, I, I actually put it in for Guillaume, but you know, hey, Cedric's here. Um, I had to do something Java related with Java, right? Java Indonesia. By the way, if you happen to notice on my machine here, uh, the name of my machine is Krakatoa which is the island between Java and Sumatra that exploded, you know, back in 1883, because I usually figure my machine is slightly off of Java, and sooner or later it'll blow up. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, is it always sunny in Philadelphia? Here's the weather in Antarctica. I believe that works too. So let me just run the script here, and it should, you should see I get all these weather reports out of this. Uh, Terra Muggas. I mean, I'm in Marlboro. I don't know where they get that silly name. Uh, I know it looks very strange to see international locations with Fahrenheit, uh, but there it is. There's Paris for you, you know, in case you were wondering. Uh, this is the one in Indonesia. It looks pretty warm. Uh, of course, it's not sunny in Philadelphia. That's a joke for the U.S. There's a television show called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and it's not, of course. And apparently, it's pretty cold in Antarctica today. Not a big surprise. When I was first writing this, we were having one of those awful winters, and I think it was colder where we were than in parts of Antarctica or something like that. All right, so let me just summarize. Uh, I've got the coerced closures... Uh, let me skip all this. Uh, delegation, the runtime metaprogramming, uh, the, I've got the, the logging methods, something about operator overloading with the human resources, creating a range with the train stations. There's some cool groovy JDK methods that you might be interested in just playing around with. Uh, so I've got some examples, permutations and combinations, the groovy JDK. I've got a nice little example in there of how to invoke a stored procedure on a database using the call method it, because it took me forever to figure out how to do that the right way and I've got the example in there in case you're interested in it. Uh, so just have a bunch of samples and some AST transforms. I added in some sortables and builders and things like that. And there's the URL for the GitHub repo. I'll push out my changes there. I'll clean up what I did during the talk and push those changes. You're welcome to all of this. So I'll hang out if you have any questions, but otherwise thank you very much for coming.